no, both, most Northerners and Southerners acquiesced in this. But the fugitive slave law will become a ve very quickly a volatile issue uh, in, in the North and in the nation because um, this was a draconian measure. And indeed, if you look at the fugitive slave law, you can forget about the idea that the South believed in states' rights. That is completely absurd. The fugitive slave law is the strongest violation of the rights of the states enacted by Congress before the Civil War. The strongest assertion of federal power over states and local authorities before the Civil War in order to protect the institution of slavery. Um, it, it, it put the rendition of slaves in the of fugitives in the hands of federal commissioners, not local judges, not local officials. F the federal government would appoint commissioners who would oversee the law. In, this, in their hearings, the, uh, the accused fugitive would have no rights, could not testify in his own behalf. Anything, it was just a question of identification. In other words, the, uh, an owner would come to him and say, hey, hey, that guy's my escaped slave, and look here, I have a description of him or here's my bill of sale from uh, Virginia. And if the commissioner said, yeah, it looks like him, yeah, back you go, the guy could not even testify in his own behalf. He could not go have a jury trial or anything like that. Um, the law imposed heavy fines on anyone who helped a fugitive slave, and it even, or on anyone who refused to assist law enforcement authorities in capturing fugitive slaves. You're just an ordinary citizen and the sheriff comes along and says, oh, there's a fugitive, you're in a posse now, you gotta help me get that. And if you say, no, 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 I don't wanna get involved in this, you're guilty of a federal crime for failing to join up with this attempt to capture that fugitive slave. Um, so the fugitive slave issue becomes extremely important in the politics of the, eight oh, by the way, the other thing Northerners objected to was that if the commissioner sent this fugitive back to slavery, he received a $10 fee, and if he said, no, no, you got the wrong guy here, he only received a $5 fee. The argument was, well, there was more paperwork involved in sending someone back to slavery than in freeing him. Um, the law presented a real danger to African Americans who had lived in the North for decades, it was totally ex post facto. You could have escaped in the 1820s and you still could be caught up in this law. And it actually was a danger to uh, free blacks, people who are not fugitives. In fact, the, one of the first cases in late 1850 from Pennsylvania illustrated that problem. A, a, uh, a, well, agents of an owner got into Pennsylvania, identified someone as a fugitive slave, brought him before a U.S. commissioner, he was sent back to the Maryland, I guess it was, where the owner said, no, no, this is the wrong guy. This is not my slave. It was very easy to just get caught up in, that, in the system set up in the, by the fugitive slave law. Now, almost all the fugitive slaves who got to the north came from the upper south, right? From Maryland, maybe from Virginia, Delaware, Kentucky. You're not getting up here from Alabama. That's a little too far. If you're trying to get away in Alabama, you're gonna to go to a city, maybe Mobile, maybe New Orleans. If you're in Florida, you might actually try to get away to the, Bahama Isle, the Bahamas or someplace, British territory. But the fugitive slave issue was important far beyond the states where most of the fugitives came from. Why? First of all, it was a test of whether the constitutional guarantees of the South would actually be respected. The Constitution says these fugitives have to be sent back, although it doesn't say who is supposed to do it. Um, and it's a, I've mentioned this before, it's an example of the extraterritoriality of slave law. Slave law reaching into the North. A person, there is no slavery in New York State after 1827. Nonetheless, New York must respect and act on the law of Maryland that makes this person a slave. So now if you got to Canada, then there was no extraterritoriality. The British, who can, the British government who controlled Canada said, well, hey, you know, we extradite criminals, no problem. If a murderer escapes to Canada, we'll send him back. 
But being a fugitive slave is not a crime in Britain or in Canada. There is no such crime because we don't have slavery. So we are not going to extradite people for doing something which is not a crime under our law. So Canada, as you know, became a refuge for thousands. After this law is passed, thousands of northern blacks, free black people, and people who were fugitives moved to Canada, went, fled to Canada. And uh, this was an unusual situation of thousands of people fleeing the United States in order to preserve their freedom. We, as I said before, we usually think of the United States as a place people come to to get freedom. Here they had to leave the United States in order to enjoy their freedom. Um, this is all on my mind because I am actually, I don't, this is a secret, I don't want to tell, you, tell anyone else about this, um, that uh, I am actually finishing a book right now on the Underground Railroad in New York City. Who helped slaves? Slaves came through all through the period, uh, 1830s, 40s, 50s. I haven't told my publisher yet, so I don't want them to know. But anyway, it's a fascinating subject, and it has made me very aware of how important this fugitive slave issue was. Because also, I mean, we get basically down to it, it humanizes or personalizes the issue of slavery. The issue of slavery is often debated in the abstract, right? And of course, it is an abstract issue. Liberty, slavery, great principles involved. But here you have actual human beings. What do you do if you are a law-abiding northerner and you're face to face with the question, do I help this person or not? And many people who were not abolitionists, who were not, anti when faced with that choice, said, all right, I'm going to help this guy. I just can't, I can't see just going to the sheriff and turning him in, you know? All right, all right, I'll give him some money and send him on his way somewhere. So it, it draws people in to the question of slavery in this very immediate, visceral kind of way that grand pronouncements may not. Anyway, um, so the fugitive slave issue will rile northern and southern politics all through the 1850s. And it, and it soon became apparent that in some parts of the North, the law was inoperative. Uh, in 1851 in Massachusetts, a, sh a slave named Shadrach was seized by the police and brought to a federal commissioner and a mob led by free blacks of Boston stormed the courthouse, rescued Shadrach, and sent him on to Canada. And this happened in, uh, in Syracuse in the so-called Jerry Rescue. There were quite a few physical or violent altercations. Uh, in Christiana, Pennsylvania, a slave owner was actually killed by a group of free blacks when he was trying to apprehend a, a group of, uh, of fugitives with the aid of, of law enforcement officials. Um, that didn't happen all that much, and it didn't happen in New York at all. New York City was a much more pro-slavery place, as I've said. It was tied into the Cotton Kingdom. But even here, there were great, uh, you know, kind of crowd activities trying to help fugitive slaves, and it, it, it became a, a, a kind of a major uh, public question. 